see if I can produce a rather short um, chapter 14, part 3 video here. Uh, so, let's see if we can accomplish something. I'm in a bit of a rush because I have to get out of the building in 30 minutes so they can lock up. Um, picking up a, a loose end here from last time. As we know, as we know, uh, the atmosphere is heavy enough to hold up a column of water 34 feet tall. And a little detail, because Paul Hewitt likes metric system, and so do I to some degree. Uh, 34 feet is about 10.3 meters. Um, you know the um, uh, kind of water pumps you might see on a farm or in some houses I've seen out, you go up Route 27, and uh, you might see a house that has a, a pump in their yard, a real pump, where you do this, and as you're going, water's going, squish, 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 okay? Uh, not the kind of pump you have at campsites. Uh, we, we call it a pump. When we go camping, the, those things they have at the campgrounds, uh, we call those pumps, but they're not pumps. Pipe sticking out of the ground, there's a handle on top, you pull the handle up and water gushes. That's not a pump. You're simply opening a valve, allowing city water pressure to come up the pipe. Uh, that's different. Now I'm talking about the real pump. And the water gushes out every time you push it down. That pump, I want to say it's pulling water up out of the ground, but it's not really doing that because you can't pull that water up. What's happening is you've got the ground, you've got this pipe going down into the ground, you've got this uh, this thing here. Can I draw this? I don't know. And you got this uh, this handle here, and you do this with the handle, and the mechanism here is actually creating low pressure inside the pipe. Well, there's water, this, uh, the ground, the water level down here, the ground, I can't think of the word, the water table down here, you go down deep enough, there is water down there. There is water down there, mingled in with the rocks and everything. You push this to lower the pressure inside the pipe, that allows the atmosphere to push the water up the pipe. Which means, if this water is any farther down than 10.3 meters, if this water table is any farther down than 34 feet, your pump will not work. If this were, say, 50 feet from here to here, you'd pump, 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 the water's going to come up to around here someplace, and it's just going to stop. You can pump all day, and it's not going to come any higher than 34 feet. So there's a limit to how well a vacuum pump can work. Um, <clears throat> then we've got these things called aneroid barometers. Do I have that here? No, I don't. An aneroid barometer. Uh, yes, we can have a barometer made of, uh, with water, but you'd have to have a, about a, like a 36 foot tall glass jar. That's not happening. Uh, you could have a mercury barometer, and yes, they do exist. A mercury barometer only needs to be about maybe 30 inches tall. Quite a difference there. Um, but to save space, we need something better. There's the aneroid barometer. Aneroid barometer. An aneroid barometer works without liquids. And here's the basic concept. You can actually make one of these of your own. If you take a can, maybe a tuna can might be convenient, and put across it um, maybe some uh, uh, plastic from a shopping bag, or no, better than that, a um, uh, garbage bag or something. Put a piece of plastic across here and attach it. Now when the atmospheric pressure is high, it's going to bend in. When the atmospheric pressure is low, it's going to bend out. You then attach a stick to here, a pointer, I'll call it, and put a measuring stick on the side here. Now when the pressure is low, so this can bow out, it points to a low point on your stick. When the pressure on a particular day is high, it points to a high point on your stick, and you've created yourself an aneroid barometer. And that's how aneroid barometers actually work. There's a diagram of the real thing on page 272. Um, you can take a look at that yourselves. Also, you can take a look for yourself. On 273, there's a diagram that explains how a vacuum pump works. Um, pretty cool concept. I have a vacuum pump in the science lab here uh, that pumps the air out of a glass jar. It's pretty cool. 
Uh, it doesn't work really well, but it works. And um, page 273 shows you how those things work. Uh, that's not required material. Now, um, Boyle's Law. We're moving along here kind of quickly. I'm watching the clock very carefully. Uh, Boyle's Law. Uh, not to be confused with Charles, Charles, Charles' Law. They're very similar. But Boyle's Law and Charles' Law, they relate how you know, gases respond to changes in temperature, pressure, and volume. Well, Boyle's Law says this. As long as you ma manage to somehow keep the temperature of the gas the same. If it heats up, you cool it off. If it gets too cold, you add some heat to it. If you keep the temperature of the gas the same, as you decrease its volume by, say, squeezing on it, if you decrease its volume, and yes, that's easy to do with gases, you can squeeze them into smaller packages. If I thought about it, I would have brought down from the science lab a little device where you can actually see that happening. I'll have to remember to do that next time. But you can squeeze the gas. As you squeeze the gas into a smaller volume, the pressure inside increases. You can feel that increased pressure because it's if you're pushing this thing in, you feel it pushing back. So as you decrease the volume, the pressure increases. Likewise, if you increase the volume, somehow manage to make it expand, the pressure inside will decrease. Um, so the, the official formula for that, make sure I get it written down correctly here, is that P1 times V1 has to equal P2 times V2. So the pressure, be, and before you make any changes, the pressure times the volume has to equal the new pressure times the new volume. Um, as you change one, the other has to change inversely. Uh, if I just throw in numbers to make this make sense, if the pressure were 5 and the volume were 2 units, maybe 5 pascals and 2 liters, if I change the pressure to 2 pascals, then the volume would become 5 liters. As one increases, the other has to decrease. As I increase pressure, the volume will decrease. It makes sense. It's simple enough that I think we can uh, kind of move on from there. Um, perhaps even more clearly explained on page 274. Well, I've got a note I wrote in my book here. Uh, what should happen if I put, take a marshmallow and put it into the vacuum chamber? You know what uh, a marshmallow is made largely of? Air. If I put it in a vacuum chamber and pump out the air, then all of that air inside the marshmallow is going to want to expand. As I decrease the pressure from, say, 5 to 2, the volume should increase from 2 to 5. That marshmallow is going to expand if I decrease the pressure. I've never actually tried it. Give me ideas here. Now, moving on to the next topic, I'm now at the bottom of page 274. Buoyancy. We've talked about buoyancy in liquids, that was chapter 13. Buoyancy in liquids, you'll remember that an object is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the displaced water. Remember that? If I've got an object here, and I've got water in there, and I've got something in here, let's have water being spilled out into a little beaker over here. When I put this object into the water, it pushed some water out of the beaker. Splish, splash, splish, splash. So, object went in, water came out. This water is equal in volume to the volume of the object I put in there. If I were to weigh this water, the weight of this water will be equal to the upward buoyant force on this object. If it displaces, say, one pound of water, then there's going to be an upward buoyant force of one pound on that object. Now, if the object weighs more than one pound, it's going to go down. But if the object weighs less than one pound, it's going to go up. If the object weighs exactly one pound, it'll stay where it is. But an object is always buoyed up by a force 
equal to the weight of the water it displaces. Pretty cool concept. That's old stuff from chapter 13. Neat thing is, it works exactly the same way in air. Consider a helium balloon. There's a string, a little knot here. Okay. We've got a helium balloon. It's uh, got a smiley face on it. Okay. Why does the helium balloon float? It floats because it's full of, well, yeah, helium. And helium is a very lightweight gas. Which means that this volume of helium in here is lighter than an equal volume of air. So the balloon is displacing its own volume of air. So the balloon is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the air it displaces. And the air it displaces is heavier than the balloon itself because the balloon is full of helium. Therefore, we have a net upward force. We've got a buoyant force equal to the weight of the displaced air. And we've got the weight of the balloon itself, which is much less than that because it's helium. And so there's a net upward force. The balloon rises. Pretty cool and pretty simple concept. Um, there is much more that could be said about that. Um, let's see, on 275, we have Archimedes' principle. It works for water and for uh, gases. It says on the top of page 275 in bold print, an object surrounded by air is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the dis air displaced. Just like with liquids. Pretty neat. Um, I've written myself a note that uh, next time I want to bring in a, a helium balloon and show you a really cool trick that I discovered in college. Um, that um, it, I, I still find, I do it year after year, and I still find it fascinating. Uh, so we'll play with that next time, provided I remember to bring in the helium balloon. I better. Okay, let's see what else we need to throw in here. Um, oh, yeah. A way to make this work even better? Think of something that's even lighter than helium. Well, hydrogen. Back in uh, chapter 11, was it? We did our hydrogen balloon detonation thing. And those hydrogen balloons really floated well because they are even lighter than helium. So the net, the net upward force was even greater. But how could we have something even lighter than helium, or lighter than hydrogen? There is nothing lighter than hydrogen. How about a total vacuum? If we could fill that balloon with nothing, then it would all be just buoyant force. No downward force of weight. That'd be kind of cool, but there's a problem. You can't fill a balloon with nothing. In fact, in order to fill anything with nothing, you've got to have a very, very strong container. Why is that? Because when you fill it with nothing, the atmosphere is going to be trying to squash it. My vacuum chamber I have upstairs is a very tough, very thick glass jar designed to withstand the air pressure around it when you take the air out from inside. You can't do that with a latex balloon. You have to have something very tough. And by the time you have something very tough to withstand the pressure of the atmosphere when it's a vacuum inside, in order for it to be tough, it has to be heavy. And if it's going to be heavy, it's going to be far heavier than the weight of the displaced air. It'll be far heavier than the buoyant force, so it's not going to go up. So you can't fill, it'd be cool if we could, but you can't fill a balloon with a vacuum it's, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, let's see. Um, how high, I'm, I'm looking at the top of page 276, how high will a, a helium balloon rise? As it rises, something interesting, interesting happens that doesn't happen in liquids. Remember with liquids, liquids are nearly incompressible. It doesn't matter how deep you go into the liquid, the density is still the same but not so with air in the atmosphere. As you rise up, the density of the air gets less and less and less. <coughs> or, in other words, the air gets thinner as you rise. There's less pressure as you go up. We addressed that earlier. So this balloon, full of, say, helium, 
as it rises, it's going to be surrounded by less and less atmosphere. There will be less and less external pressure. So as the pressure decreases, what's the balloon going to do? Pressure decreases, volume expands. So that balloon is going to, as it rises into areas of less and less pressure, the inside pressure of the balloon is going to make it expand and expand and expand. And you know what? There's going to reach a point where it goes pop. So it's, no, it's not going to float all the way to the moon. It's going to rise up until it just can't expand anymore and it pops. Or if it's a very tough balloon um, and uh, it, it, or it starts off very small and it has lots of room to expand, if it can keep on going, it will eventually stop rising. When will it stop rising? It'll stop rising when the outside pressure is equal to the inside pressure. Once that balloon expands, to a point where its inside pressure is the same as the outside pressure and it's done expanding, it'll stop. It'll hover. Um, and uh, that was, um, I remember uh, Felix Baumgartner. If you don't know about Felix Baumgartner, look him up online. Uh, he's the guy who became famous, uh, sponsored by Red Bull, who um, uh, jumped out of a, um, a, a hot air balloon from I've forgotten how many miles up, it was an amazing story. Um, he became famous for having broken all previous records. Then another guy came along about a year later and dem demonstrated that uh, you can do it a lot cheaper than Felix did it. Uh, Felix had the back end of Red Bull and they put millions and millions of dollars into the project. And then the other guy came along a year later and proved that you don't have to have millions and millions of dollars to do it. And he did it much more cheaply and beat Felix Bumgardner's record. But no one knows about the other guy I don't remember his name, because he wasn't sponsored by Red Bull, and he wasn't on TV, and he wasn't made famous uh, like Felix was. But they used a hot air balloon, and the thing, it was, wait, or was it hot air or was it something else? Did they use helium? No, they didn't use hot air. That couldn't be. They had to have used helium. I'm sorry. But that thing rose and rose and rose and rose and rose. It actually rose farther than they expected it to. It rose until the exterior pressure and the interior pressures were equal, and once that happened, it stopped rising. And at that point, he jumped out of his capsule and uh, broke world records for skydiving. Um, yes, he had to have a spacesuit up there. Uh, it was quite, quite a, an undertaking. Okay, um, let's see. That takes us to the top of 276 and brings us to a very bizarre concept. Oh, can I throw this in or not? Um, I've been going for about 15 minutes. All right, let's throw in Bernoulli's principle. And if I successfully finish talking about Bernoulli's principle today, then we will definitely be able to finish next time. So this chapter will be broken into four parts instead of five. So let's go for it. Bernoulli's principle. Now. I personally don't like Bernoulli's Principle because it's weird. Bernoulli's Principle says this. When a fluid is flowing, the pressure in that fluid decreases. Here's the diagram Paul Hewitt gives us that helps to explain what that means. Suppose I've got a pipe, and that pipe is shaped kind of like this. And I'm squeezing some water through this pipe. So I've got water flowing through the pipe, going like this, and like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. As the water's going through the pipe, from the large part of the pipe to the smaller part of the pipe, Bernoulli's principle says, well, first of all, can you see how the water in here has to be moving faster? Because whatever's going in on this side has to come out on that side, correct? But this is a larger area. Uh, yes, uh, I'm being told that I have to leave soon. Uh, by five? Okay, good. Thank you. So, the, um, whatever water goes in here has to come out there. I've got more water going in here. So it's got to come out. It has to go in here at one speed, but it's got to come out at a faster speed so that the volume in equals the volume out. Make sense? This water has to be moving faster. Bernoulli's principle says, that as this water is moving faster, it's going to actually have less internal pressure. If you have bubbles here, 
He illustrates this on page um, 277. If we've got bubbles here, the weird and hard to believe thing is, as those bubbles get squeezed into the narrower section here, they will actually get bigger, not smaller. That doesn't make any sense. I know what you mean. I've got some things I can uh, show you in the uh, next video that will help make this make more sense. But for right now, obviously, uh, I'm out of time. So uh, I will stop there. Bernoulli's principle that pressure in a fluid actually decreases as the speed of the fluid increases. Bernoulli's principle. So more on that next time. So for now, uh, farewell. Oh, no quiz questions this time. Um, next time, perhaps we'll insert some quiz questions. So we are done. And see you next time for our fourth and last installment, if all goes well.